In this appendix, I'm going to discuss parametrized curves and, and motion. The, the, the point is that when an object moves, so an object, a car, a particle, a block, when an object moves, in this course we've been assuming, or typically we assume, that the motion is in a straight line. The reason we do that is so that time is one variable and you have a function of time and the position can be described by one variable. So you put in one time and you, one real number and you get back one real number. This course is single variable calculus or single variable differential calculus. There's a whole other course called multivariable calculus where you deal with functions involving more variables. However, motion is frequently not in a line. It's in physics and in lots of problems. Uh, Thing, objects move in the plane, so the xy plane, or r2, real two-dimensional Euclidean space. Things also move in space, so in xyz space, in r3, three-dimensional real Euclidean space. Um, but they're still just a function of one variable, time. And really, in, for lots of questions, you can just treat this function that you give one real number to and it gives you back two or three real numbers you can treat that as just a collection of two motions in straight lines. Like You just look at what happens in the x direction and the y direction, and the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. Um, you know, even when something's not moving in a straight line, certain aspects of the problem break up into questions of, kind of functions of a single variable that give back a single variable. So that's what I want to discuss. Um, so let's take an example. Suppose a particle, a particle is moving in R2. This is two-dimensional real Euclidean space. Most people think of it as the xy plane um, with position um, such that, such that we know it's x-coordinate and it's y-coordinate at any time t, such that its x-coordinate at time t is 2t minus 1, and its y-coordinate at time t is 2t minus 1 quantity squared. All right. So this is a typical example of a parametrized curve. It's you're given the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate as functions of time. So that at any time, you know exactly where the particle is. Oh, you might be objecting, oh, well, the particle has size. Which part of the particle? Well, either I'm thinking of the particle ideally as a point, so that it only occupies a point in space, or you could take some point on the particle, like the center of mass. So when I say the particle is at this coordinate, um, I mean, its center of mass or the point particle. Um, okay, this is an example of a parametrized curve. Now, you can eliminate the reference to t in this example because it's easy. Um, x is 2t minus 1, y is 2t minus 1 squared. So that means that at any time, a particle. Well, the x and y coordinates of the particle satisfy an equation, or we would say the particle is on the curve, defined by y equals x squared. Right? If the particle is moving in this manner, its y coordinate is always its x coordinate squared. Um, this is the kind of thing that we want to look at. It's, um, the, the nice thing about it is that for lots of questions, you can break this up into just this kind of motion in a straight line. It's not in a straight line. The particle's moving along a parabola. But if you just look at the x-coordinate, you can just talk about how the x-coordinate changes with time. And if you just look at the y-coordinate, you can talk about how just the y-coordinate changes with time. But really, what we've got 
is a function x of t, y of t. So an ordered pair of functions. And this is a function that st starts on the real line. So you give it a real number. So I'll write this black bold, bold r, but this is just the set of all real numbers, which we frequently write as the interval from minus infinity to infinity. And it gives you back a pair, an ordered pair of real numbers. So this is what a parametrized curve in the plane actually is, although the domain doesn't have to be all of R, and the codomain doesn't have to be all of R too. In fact, we know that the range of this function, so the set of points that actually gets hit, is, lies on the curve y equals x squared. So the range, right, the range of a function, it's the set of values that the function, function actually attains, the range of this parametrized curve that we had, 2t minus 1, comma, 2t minus 1 squared, is, well, the curve defined by, I'll just say the curve, is the curve y equals x squared. Um, really, by showing that the x and y coordinates satisfy this equation, we only know the range is part of that curve. We only know that the particle lies on, it definitely lies on y equals x squared, but do we really know that you get the whole thing? Well, in fact, we do, because as t goes from minus infinity to infinity, this x-coordinate would sweep out all the x-coordinates on this parabola. So yes, um, we do know that the range of this is this curve. And when talking about parametrized curves, sometimes it's unclear what someone means by the curve. The parametrized curve is this function. Its range is what you normally call a curve, this geometric object. Um, okay, uh, parametrized curves contain a lot more information than just the path that they trace out, or the, the curve that's their range. For instance, if you're given y equals x squared, that in no way tells you which x and y coordinates a particle is at it at a given time. Right? For the, you lose a lot of information when you pass to this Cartesian equation. For instance, where is the particle at time zero? It's at the or ordered pair of points. At time zero, you'd be at minus one, one. So at time zero, you're at minus one, one. So here's minus one, here's one. <clears throat> you're at this point. As the, so this is t equals zero. Um, at t equals a half, you're at zero, zero. So here you are at t equals a half. At t equals 1, you'd be at 1, 1. So here you are. Here's the particle at t equals 1. And the particle is moving in this direction. We didn't have to sketch a bunch of points to know that. As t gets bigger, um, certainly the x coordinate's getting bigger, but you know, it helps to identify a few points on a parametrized curve. Okay. Um, Let's, let's look at, well, some notions associated with parametrized curves. So, what's the velocity? What, or what's the position? What's the velocity? What's the acceleration? Well, I'm going to use the term vectors, uh, but this isn't a multivariable calculus course. So, really, a serious discussion of vectors will have, would have to wait for a different course, but it's not too difficult to describe right now. So suppose you've got a parametrized curve. I'm going to take a parametrized curve into R3 this time so that I have three coordinates. At any time, I'm thinking you know the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate, and the z-coordinate of, of a particle or some other object. By the way, I keep talking about motion, but, but t doesn't have to be the time, and this doesn't have to be the position of something moving. You can just describe mathematical curves this way. And in that context, it's, well, 
even in the other context, T. T is called the parameter. It's, in a way, you're thinking of you've got some curve in terms of x and y, and you want to describe the x and y coordinates on the curve in terms of a third independent variable that's allowed to vary independently. Um, well, it varies and can be essentially anything, and it determines x and y. So that's called the parameter. Um, these individual functions, so t is the parameter, the individual functions, x of t, y and t, y of t, and z of t, are called the component functions. refer to this as the x component, the y component, the z component. Um, this, this is a function. You give it one real number, so one real number, and it gives you back three real numbers. And it tells you, for instance, at each time where some particle is. If you've never looked at plotting things or looking at things in three dimensions, don't worry. Just think of uh, moving in the plane, moving in the xy plane, and just omit the z coordinate, everything I'm saying. You get analogous things in the plane. So, what definitions do you make here? Uh, you make the following definitions. We have the position vector, that's the triple in the plane, it would be the pair, x of t, y of t. But it's called the position or the position vector. Um, don't let the term vector scare you. Uh, the position vector is what you start with. So right now I'm dealing with motion. I am thinking of an object moving. T is the time. X and Y and Z are the actual X, Y, and Z coordinates of the object at time T. So the position vector is X of T, Y of T, z of t. Now, assuming that you've, you've already read the chapter on derivatives, um, I'm going to talk about the, the velocity vector and the acceleration vector. If you haven't, if, you ha if you're doing this, looking at this appendix before you've talked about derivatives, you can safely wait and come back and look at what I'm saying now later. Um, the velocity vector. It's, it's an ordered triple of functions. It's just the derivatives of each of the component functions. The component functions of the velocity are the instantaneous rates of change of the position functions. So if you get this, you won't be surprised that the acceleration vector is the derivative of the velocity vector. Oh, if this frequently you would denote this so by p of t with a little vector symbol over the p. This might be v of t, which we would just write as the vector p prime of t. The acceleration vector would be x double prime of t, y double prime of t, z double prime of t. That's the derivative of the velocity vector, or what's the same thing, the second derivative of the position vector. So you make those definitions. There is one definition that you can't handle component-wise. So for, for instance, these. Suppose you were asked about the x component of the velocity. The x component of the velocity. Well, yeah, I define these vectors, and you might be a little scared. Oh, vectors. Ah. But just ignore the fact that 
I wrote them all together. And just if you're asked for the x component of the velocity, you could have just looked at x of t in the first place. Forget y of t and z of t. The x component of the velocity, a lot of people would write a v sub x. Some people would, a lot of people wouldn't. So notation varies. But the x component of the velocity only depends on x. And if you're asked about, yeah, as a function of t, and if you're asked about the x component of the acceleration, it's just x double prime of t. And this is why I said that in a lot of ways, you can treat questions about the motion of an object in the plane or in space is just a collection of, of questions about, about objects moving in straight lines. Because as far as this is concerned, this is exactly, if you just thought, ignored the y, y and z components, and just looked at x of t, you could think, oh, I've got a particle moving along the x-axis. Now, it's not moving along the x-axis. It could be moving in a very complicated way in space. But as far as calculating the x component of the velocity and the x component of the acceleration, you would get the same thing if you just thought of the particle as moving in the, in the x-axis, even though that is not what's happening. You could just take x of t, take its derivative and its second derivative, and it's reduced to a problem in a line. Same thing for y of t and z of t. So when dealing with motions of particles in the plane or in space, yes, it, it's, you should realize that you're thinking of all three of these functions together. But when you actually have to answer questions about velocity and acceleration, you can frequently just look at, or always, if those are the questions, um, well, it depends on the question. You can frequently just think of it as three separate motions and three separate axes. Um, all right, what I was saying that there's one of these, there's a definition that we need or that's nice to have that where you can't treat these separately because it involves all three of them at once, speed. Speed, the magnitude of the velocity vector. And the magnitude, it's like um, distance for position. It's the square root of the sum of the squares. So the speed is x prime, the square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared oops, plus z prime of t squared. If you just have motion in the plane, of course, you wouldn't have this z component. Magnitude is frequently written with absolute value signs, indicated with absolute value signs. So people would write as the magnitude of the velocity vector. So this is here's magnitude of velocity. So the velocity is a vector. This is just one real number back again. Well, it's a function that gives you back one real number. Um, you may wonder why, how, why we use absolute value signs for the magnitude of the velocity vector. Well, if you just have motion in a line, the, absolute, the magnitude there, so would, you would think, ah, the square root of x prime of t squared, but the square root of something squared of a real number squared is its absolute value. And this would just be the absolute value of x prime of t. Well, that's what we want, right? If you have motion in a straight line and the velocity has either a plus or minus sign attached to it, speed is the absolute value of that. So yes, this is a generalization of the notion of speed in a line. Okay, but I may have made all this look scary again. Let me make it look less scary. I'm trying just to use polynomial functions in this discussion because this is an appendix and I don't know at what point you'll be looking at this and I don't want to assume you've seen a bunch of the functions that occur later in the textbook. So let me take, let's see, there were some I wanted to use. Let's take x equals x equals 1 minus t squared, and y equals t to the fourth plus 2. So I'm going to assume a particle moves. So I'm assuming, assume x and y are measured in meters. 
or how about feet? Assume x and y are measured in feet. T is in seconds. And for t greater than or equal to zero, we usually think t equals zero is when we start talking about the situation. So we've started our stopwatches at some time, and we call that t equals zero. And for t greater than or equal to zero, um, a particle is moving in the plane, so in the xy plane, so in R2. in such a way that its x and y coordinates are given by those equations. Well, so I'll just say in the plane according to the given equation. Okay. We can ask all kinds of questions about this. Um, one question, you cannot always do what I'm about to do. I, I'm, one question is, can we describe the curve that this is moving along? So really the image of the parametrized curve, something defined, described just in terms of x and y. Um, that means eliminating the t parameter. And algebraically, if these were very complicated, we would have no hope of doing this. You could have a computer plot a bunch of points for you, or maybe your calculator um, could sketch it for you. But um, yeah, so can we describe this curve, the, you know, I'd say this curve, but that means the range of the parameterized curve. Can we describe the range? So the point you actually hit. So a lot of people would think of this as the curve. So the curve it sweeps out. Can we describe the range of this parameterized curve? without reference to t. And the answer is yes, we can, because, for instance, we could solve, we can solve this equation for t squared and then use that this is t squared quantity squared and then eliminate the reference to the t's. So yes, um, you rewrite that first equation. It says t squared equals 1 minus x. And then you look at y equals t to the fourth plus 2. But t to the fourth is t squared squared. And then put in that t squared is 1 minus x. And you get y is 1 minus x quantity squared plus 2. And if you want, you can expand this. This is x squared. And you get a minus 2x plus 1 plus 2, so plus 3. So that's the path that the particle moves along. But, but we don't actually know that you get all of it for t greater than or equal to 0. In fact, that seems unlikely because t is greater than or equal to 0. But we'll check. And we'd like to know, you know, can we say which direction the particle's moving in along the path? So this parabola. Um, uh, if, depending on what you remember about parabolas, let's say this is always, this is something squared plus 2. So this is always greater than or equal to 2. 2 is its minimum, and it occurs when x is 1. So that's the vertex of the parabola. The, when x is 1 and y is 2, so the vertex of the parabola is roughly here. Um, it curves upward because we have a positive coefficient in front of the x squared term. So it roughly looks like, and when x is 0, we get 3, so it roughly looks like this. Okay. So here's, ignoring my usual problems with scale, this is supposed to be y equals x squared minus 2x plus 3. Okay. But do we get this whole curve? No, 
We don't. <coughs> T is greater than or equal to zero. Um, what does that mean? It means that this is always less than or equal to one. As T gets bigger, our X coordinate gets smaller. And as T goes to infinity, uh, the X coordinate goes to negative infinity. Um, so our X coordinate is starting at one, it keeps getting smaller, and it goes to negative infinity. Our X coordinate starts here. It goes. And yeah, increasing T values here. Put some arrows on the curve. We're headed that way. Here you are at T equals zero. Um, you could plot some other points. For instance, when are we, when are we at Y coordinate three? Well, that's when X is zero. When is X equal to zero? When T is one. Um, you might say when T is minus one, but T has to be greater than or equal to zero. So here we are at T equals one so on. So the particle is moving along this curve that way. Okay, what other questions could you ask about such a situation? Oh, tons. You could ask, um, what's, what is the average velocity in the y direction? This, this would be a typical phrasing um, in the y direction between times t equals 0 and t equals 2. All right. This is asking about the y component. It's just a question about y. You don't even need to think of this as motion in the plane. You can just take that your y coordinate is t to the fourth plus two and just deal with that. You want the, the average velocity, uh, that means the average rate of change of the position with respect to time. But when you say the y direction, you mean the y position, just the y coordinate. And so all this is, this a rock, this average rate of change that we're after, it's just the change in y over the change in t. And so you take the y coordinate at time 2, subtract the y coordinate at time 0, and divide by 2 minus 0. We get uh, 2 to the fourth, 16 plus 2, that's 18 minus y at 0, which is 2, divided by 2. So you get 16 over 2, that's 8 units, feet per second. All right, that's a typical question. Um, you could ask for the average rate of change of the x coordinate. So that's the average velocity in the x direction. You could ask for the average acceleration. Um, well, of course, then you'd have to know the velocities. So I'm about to assume that you have done um, the calculus section or the calculus sections in the book, so I've gone through at least chapter one, um, because I do want to talk about the velocity and acceleration at time two. So you could be asked, what are the velocity, speed, and acceleration of the particle? the parameterization, so it's x equals 1 minus t squared, y equals t to the fourth plus 2. That's what we're looking at. Um, how do you do this? Well, it doesn't say x direction or y direction, so it means the vectors, but that just means you write both at the same time. So the vector, the position vector, 
xy as functions of t is 1 minus t squared t to the fourth plus 2. This is the whole vector is measured in feet. p prime, the velocity, the velocity vector, p prime of t. It's just, well, just differentiate each one of these separately. Now I'm about to assume you've gone through the first section of chapter 2 because I'm going to use power rule and linearity to differentiate these, but you only need chapter 1 at least for this to make sense. Um, the derivative of this is minus 2t. The derivative of this is 4t cubed. Okay. And this is in feet per second. That means each component has units feet per second. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity vector, which is the second derivative of the position. But it means you differentiate this, and we just get minus 2 and 12t squared feet per second per second. Feet per, a lot of people would say feet per second squared. Um, that's what you get. The speed is the magnitude of the velocity. So the speed's a little speed at time t. And I don't know of a standard letter for the speed. It's just the magnitude of the velocity vector. There's no reason you couldn't write s, but my s's look like 5, so maybe I'll avoid it. It's the magnitude of the velocity. That's the square root of minus 2t squared plus 4t cubed squared. This is the square root of, this is 4t squared. This isn't going to get real pretty no matter what we do to it, but, and this is 16t to the sixth. It's true we can pull out um, a 4t squared from each point. We take its square root, so we get a 2t. I don't need absolute values because we're assuming t is greater than or equal to 0. So I get a 2t and then times the square root of 1 plus 4t to the fourth. And this is also in feet per second. This is the speed. All right. That's what you get. Um, I'd like to look at one more question about this parameterized curve before I talk about just kind of making up parameterizations for curves. One other thing you could ask about this, or there are a bunch of other things, but one of them is what is the slope of the tangent line to the range of this curve, so to the path that the particle is moving along. So what is the slope of the tangent line to the path of the particle? at time t equals 2 seconds. OK. There are two ways to do this. And one, one probably occurs to you most quickly, since I have y as a function of x right there. We also know that x equals 1 minus t squared. So at time, at time 2, x is 1 minus 2 squared, so x is minus 3. So this is the same as saying when x is minus 3. We're asking for the slope of the tangent line to this curve um, where x equals minus 3. But that's its derivative. Again, I'm assuming you're familiar with chapter 1. So this is the same as dy dx evaluated x equals minus 3. dy dx is 2x minus 2. You evaluate at x equals minus 3, and you get minus, um, minus 6, minus 2, minus 8. Units, well, it would be feet per feet, but those cancel out, so just it's unitless. Minus 8. Okay. My question is, could we have gotten that without writing y in terms of x? After all, I've said that if the 
parameterized curve was very complicated at all, you wouldn't be able to solve for y in terms of x. So you wouldn't be able to write something like this. You wouldn't be able to calculate dy dx like this. Is there another way you could do it that uses the parameterizations? The answer is yes. So, how do you do it? You do what you might guess you would do if you've been through the section on the chain rule. Um, there are technical reasons why this is okay. It has to do with the function being invertible and or with the function of x being invertible and then the chain rule. But I'm just going to, to tell you the answer. It's you want dy dx in terms of the parameterization, it's dy dt over dx dt. Just like the chain rule itself looks like cancellation of fractions, so does this. It's, you think if this were a fraction, you would invert it, multiply, the dt's would cancel, you'd get this. These are not fractions, but that is the kind of thing that's going on. And so what we're going to do is calculate dy dx this way when, x, when t is 2. The nice thing about this is it doesn't require you to solve for y in terms of x. It also doesn't even require you to figure out what the x-coordinate is at time 2. You're just going to do this calculation at time 2. dy dt is 4t cubed. dx dt is minus 2t. You evaluate this at t equals 2. We could do some cancellation first, but it hardly matters. At t equals 2, you'll get 4 times 8, so you get 32 over minus 4, you get minus 8, which is what we got before. Of course, this is math. But it's not a, you know, even if we couldn't solve for y in terms of x, we could do this kind of thing to find the slope of the tangent line. All right, that's actually all I, all I want to say about parameterized motion. You can just deal with the components separately as far as the velocity and acceleration go. The speed, the speed actually uses every component of the velocity, so that's a different question entirely. Um, but there is one other kind of thing we do with parameterizations that's um, a little weird, and I want to say something about it. So suppose we don't start with a parameterized curve. Suppose we just start with some curve described to us in terms of y and x. <laughs> okay. So you do that. Here's another example. Suppose you just start with the curve y equals 7 plus x cubed. Yes, I could sketch this. You should be able to, well, I guess I will sketch it, but you don't need to sketch it. y equals x cubed, you should know what that looks like. It looks roughly like this, roughly. And then you lift it up seven units, so you raise the y-coordinate seven units. So I'll just raise that. That's not, sorry, that didn't come down enough like that. All right, so very roughly, this looks like this, where this is seven. It's irrelevant to what I'm about to say. So you start with some curve defined for you, described for you in terms of x and y, <laughs> you were asked to parameterize it. Okay. Parameterize this curve. What does that mean and why would you want to do it? Or maybe I should answer the why would you want to do it first. If you're thinking of something moving, an object moving like I was discussing before this, this seems really silly. It should seem really silly. We're told, we're told like the path that the object moved along, so the, the range of a parameterized curve, and we are just about to make up its position at various times t. Um, from that point of view, what, what I'm about to do seems silly. There is a point to doing it, though, and it'll be more clear in the next problem. 
but what we'd like is for, is especially when we have a, a curve that is not the graph of a function, what you'd like, you'd like to deal with functions in calculus. And so we'd rather have a parameterized curve describing x and y, and at least have the x-coordinates be a function, of, the x-coordinate be a function of t, and the y-coordinate be a function of t, and work with two functions instead of this one equation that doesn't describe a function. Um, it's just nicer that way. It'll be more clear in the next example. I didn't want to do that one first because I wanted to say that parameterizations are not unique, and this is a nice example to do it that way. So what we want to make up, what we want to do is make up a parameterized curve whose range is this. So that's what this means. You know, parameterize this curve. This means find a parameterized curve whose range is this curve. Now, in general, you'd like for parameterizations to be nice in other ways. You'd like for them to be or continuous or component functions. You'd like for them to be differentiable. You'd like for um, the function the parameterization to be one-to-one -one or at least locally one-to-one -one or some conditions like that. But um, different people would require different things of a parameterization, so I'm just going to leave that up in the air. Um, but, for instance, what is a parameterization? Well, for any function, y equals f of x, there's an easy parameterization that's just kind of silly. You can let x be t. Well, then if x is t, y is f of t. So, you know, for this function, that means, for that, sorry, for that equation, it means we'd be saying, okay, we want to parameterize y equals 7 plus x cubed, this is just a function. And what I just said is, there's the easy parameterization, let x be t, and then y is 7 plus t cubed. This seems silly, we just introduced another variable that's exactly the same as x. But, um, you know, we are kind of thinking of it as, yeah, maybe there was a particle moving, and at time t, this is where it was. But this isn't the only parameterization. There are an infinite number of possible parameterizations, and one isn't necessarily better than the others. Some are more obvious than others. But, for instance, we could have said x is 2t. And then y would need to be 7 plus the 2t quantity cubed, so plus 8t cubed. If we're just making up parameterizations, there's no reason to say this one's better than this one. Um, Okay, what's, what's another possible one? You don't just have to multiply t by things. Means we can let y be t. And then if you solve for x, you would get an x is, so it put t here, you'd subtract 7, take the cube root, would be t minus, the cube root of t minus 7. So there's another parameterization of this curve. The point is, if you're given a curve in terms of x and y, and you're asked to parameterize it, you're told to parameterize, parameterize it. That doesn't, you know, there are an infinite number of ways to do it unless someone gives you a lot more specifics about what kind of parameterization they want. Let me do one more example. Here I'll have to assume that you're familiar with sine and cosine. Um, so let me look at Look at x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. You should recognize this as an equation describing an ellipse. An ellipse that's centered at hk, centered at the point hk, and whose semi, semi major and semi minor so this would be so a and b are greater than zero. Um, and this might uh, yeah this would be a 
This is big. Um, OK. So this is an ellipse. This equation describes an ellipse centered at hk. This is not the graph. This is not the graph of a function. It doesn't pass a vertical line test. And so, as I said, one reason to make up a parameterization for this is well, what we could do is solve this for y um, in terms of x, except there'd be a plus or minus sign, one part describing the top half, one part describing the bottom half. But it's nicer to parameterize this and just, just write down a parameterization of this ellipse that starts over here with this right hand most point. And I'll have it move counterclockwise around the ellipse. until it comes back. If you've, if you've read the section on sine and cosine, you should realize it's like a circle. Well, by the way, you do get a circle. I call this an ellipse, but if A equals B, you get a circle of radius A. Um, you should know that parameterizing a circle is what sine and cosine do. So yeah, one nice the standard parameterization for this would be x equals h plus a cosine of t, and y equals k plus b sine of t. The adding h and k is just to, to take care of the fact that we have x minus h and y minus k. Aside from that, a and b are these constants, and you should just think, oh, sine and cosine of t. As t starts increasing, cosine starts decreasing, and sine increases. Um, we'd come back around. Sine and cosine are 2 pi periodic. So if you want to parameterize everything at each point, at each point exactly once, say that t is greater than or equal to 0 and less than 2 pi. So you come right back to here. Um, does this always lie on this curve? Yeah. It doesn't. What I'm about to do doesn't prove that it gives you the whole curve, but shows that it lies on that curve, well, you can eliminate the reference to t. And that would show it lies on this curve. And then you have to know what about sine and cosine to know it takes you all the way around one time. But you can subtract h from both sides. So suppose you're given this. How would you know that it describes that the, the range of it is an ellipse? Subtract h from both sides of this, and you'll get this equation. Subtract k from both sides of this, and you get this equation. We want to use the fundamental trig identity, that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. But we have this a and b here. So you divide by a, so you get x minus h over a. You divide this by b, you get y minus k over b. And now here's sine, here's cosine. If you square this and add this squared, you should get 1, the fundamental trig identity. And that is exactly the equation we have x minus h over a quantity squared plus y minus k over b quantity squared equals 1. And yes, of course, you can break this up as squaring the numerator and dividing by the square of the denominator. All right, that's all I want to say about parameterized curves. There are two kinds of, two typical kinds of problems. There's motion in which you're given the parameter and it's time and you're given the position the x, y, and if you're in space, the x, y, and z coordinates of an object at time t. And then there are these problems where you're given a curve in terms of x and y. Um, it would be harder to do this in space, and really you would normally parameterize curves in space. But in the plane, you could be given a term, in, uh, a curve in terms of x and y, and then you could be asked to parameterize it, which just means to come up with some parameterized curve whose range is the curve that you've been given. Um, but it is not, you might be given extra restrictions, like the parameterized curve should be one to one, or the speed should be something, or the function should be continuous. It just depends on what you're asked to do.